Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO at the start of a new campaign in which we're playing as everyone's favorite, EuroLeague. So if you'd like to read about them, please go right ahead. Uh, the EuroLeague is going to be really great, especially since we get to fight the Dovanga Brigade eventually, probably, and maybe even Magnitogorsk. So, it'll be great. And our allies, of course, Orenburg, but we'll see what happens with Alone in the Cold. Formed from the union of Gulag guards and prisoners, the Euro League has remade itself into a force to be reckoned with in the Southern Urals. We fight against all odds to defend our home and our people, while we have maintained our position of strength. Our lands are being flooded by a tide of refugees, threatening to destabilize us. With enemies on all sides, we must resolve this crisis quickly, or risk losing all that we've worked hard so far for. Yes. Assess our situation and prepare defenses in our cities to prepare for future conflicts. Watching the border. Identifying the threats. Let's watch the border first. Our brave guards defend the borders of our lands with the ferocity and loyalty of a mighty mother bear. The border is a tough place which needs an even tougher soldier to defend it. Now more than ever, we need these tougher men to defend against our enemies in Orsk and Black Mountain. Dovanga and Lysenko prowl our borders like starving wolves, but our sentinels will not yield to them a single inch. So right now, actually we're losing political power, we're getting some political power, which is pretty good. The fierceness of the Euro Guard, combined with our notoriously strict standards, have transformed us into legends that reach far beyond the territory we directly control. Our reputation has caused many to seek us out, with the objective of joining the guard themselves. This couple of the recent tides of refugees along the Urals means that we receive a constant stream of new initiates, hoping to pass our strict trials to become fully fledged members of the guard. New guards are initiated every 50 days. Currently, the expected number of initiates to pass their final trials is 300, and at max capacity, our training facilities could handle around 600. This amount could be raised either by lowering our standards somewhat or reserving more equipment for use in training for these initiates. But some members of the guard question the competence such recruits would possess, claiming that the resources uh, that go into their training could be better put use in the hands of trained soldiers. But thunder and lightning. But those in the starlight sky. The tiny specks of light in the ocean of darkness below were ants ready to be squashed, or even more ominously, like fireflies before a storm. Meaningless and out of touch. Yet the German bombers had a very meaningful impact on those below. For the poor and isolated Russian farmers and the struggling communes, the roar of the dark machines above them symbolized nothing short of a game of chance. Will it be us today, or the farm next door? For so many had become a daily ritual, playing this morbid gambling game. Sneaking their lives again and again, would it be bombing today? Your starvation Maybe a raiding band? Only time will tell. So, what did... So, actually, something did put commodities on, after all. What did money mean these days? When the Germans had first come, many had tried to hide, flee, just to survive. Nowadays, the incessant bombing campaigns have become normalized as part of the Russian psyche. If you would ask either of these men in these... Or those, either of those men in the skies who drop the same bombs every day on the same people, or the people on the ground who had the same bombs dropped on them every single day, you get a very similar answer as to what constituted their daily life. A game in life of death. Those who had chose to kill and those who had to endure. Neither party unable by outside influence to stop the brutal, never-ending cycle in a morbid case of empathy and solidarity twice now. During New Year's Eve, some German bombers had dropped fireworks instead of their normal payload. A beautiful display of color for that for a single time during that year stopped the monotony of thunder and lightning. The next day, the eternal gamble continued. Life is real and uncertain. If you want about the modern bogatier, please go right ahead. The Guard Relief Brigade. To many in the village, the avalanche occurred without warning or even sense. The snow came crashing down the mountain, only stopping as it swept landed on houses, streets, and with a shock and horror, people only stopping when the force behind it was too weak to continue. By the end of it, the village had almost had all of its buildings destroyed, and almost half of its population dead or injured. Half a day later arrived six men, armed with rifles and driving trucks. They had the crash and went to explore. Upon discovering the tragedy, they left their vehicles and began the long, arduous process of digging the snow and the rocks and rubbish that surrounded the village, propping up the makeshift tents for those who needed a home, digging up those who were trapped under the snow, and providing medical attention when needed. They even created a village, burying the 30 victims after identification. For the most part, it would have been nice, but fundamentally forgotten moment in Ural history. Uh, it would have remained that way if Vasily Zatsev had him found out after the guards returned home, discussing the reason for the delay. And from there, Zatsev petitioned Mendrix to petition, expand on this idea, who, after some resi reluctance, approved Zatsev's creation of the Guard Relief Brigade, dedicated towards disaster and emergency relief for the citizens of the Southern Urals, to protect those incapable of protecting themselves and identifying our threats. Gruesome stories of Dovang's bandits and Lysenko's men have been reaching our guards recently. While likely untrue, tales of the entire villages being abducted and grotesque experiments being conducted upon men, women, and children have unnerved the less resolute of our guard. A few of the weaker men and women in the guard have to be disciplined in order to keep them in line with the rest of our troops. This fear must be uprooted at the source if we were to fight back. We will remain strong and stand firm against the monstrous men of the bandit and the scientist. <clears throat> we could get more guards, but we lose some guns. We do want some more guys, though. We do get some more army XP, though. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, lower the number of initiates. I would prefer a little bit more, actually. So, yeah, once, maybe. Oh, we get 60 more. That's it. No, that's not worth it. The Euro Guard. We are soldiers of the Euro Guard. Children of the Vorkutlag uh, in the frigid north. 
Formed out of a most unlikely union of political prisoners and the guard who once oppressed them, we have struggled endlessly to survive in the ashes of the motherland. When the snow threatened to consume us, we left lands that were once our prison and embarked on a grueling march to seek refuge in the south. We have lost so much and have all seen the darkness this new world has to offer, but in the end we made it to the lands we now call home. Though we have suffered far more than all of our ancestors before us, we have never let the darkness corrupt our hearts. When we arrived beneath the slops or slopes <laughs> of the Ural Mountains, we found all manner of survivors, wanderers, and innocents in need of protection from the dangers of the world. We became the shield, and soon more and more they became drawn to the warm fires within our new fortresses. Over this last decade we have trained without rest, honing ourselves into a force of warriors pledged to defend those who cannot defend themselves. We have recently come into contact with a loose collection, or collection of communes around Nuremberg. They are a spirited but disorganized people, defenseless against the horrors of the wastes. Some of our soldiers have begun heading west to offer aid and support to the villages, though our men have not always been greeted warmly. There are also worrying rumors coming from the east, villages ablaze, families disappearing into the night, and other Germans on the march once again. What are foul horrors lurk in the shadows? It falls to us to be a candle in this dark new world. If not us, then who? Yeah, it's not many initiates. But that's alright. Also, what do we have? We're led by Janis Menzrex. If you're going to bed him, please go ahead. The long march remember. I'm deeply moved by the fact that you've all chosen to join me tonight, Janis Menzrex said solemnly to the gathered crowd. This is a special gathering every year, befitting his former status as a priest, he gave a mass remembering those who fell on the great march southwards from the Gulag to the mountains, where the League was eventually founded. Menzrex paused briefly to allow the audience to clap before beginning again. We've all suffered greatly in our time. We've suffered in in incarceration, forced labor, frigid winters, great treks through heckish conditions, and the predations of all the worst examples of humanity. We've all lost somebody we deeply cared about, not because they were weak or undeserving, but because fate wasn't on their side that day. He recited a list of names going from those who had perished in the prison camps all those years ago to those who had been killed just weeks before. He gave thanks and condolences to those grieving relatives in the crowd, and bade the crowd to treat them with compassion. We sometimes wonder why, with all the world's cruelty, there even is a point to go on. To you doubters, I say, look around you. There's so many people who care for you, who will die for you in an instant. All of our hardships wasn't for nothing, because we have each other. God challenges us, not to tear us down, but to help us grow and to bring us together. When you think of giving up, just think about how much so many people sacrificed to bring you here, and to, seek, and to emulate them in how you treat others. That said, I'd like you all to join me in a moment of prayer to those who have fallen into us, those for whom they gave their lives to protect. Amen. Oh, there's a ton of reading here. Holy cow. Ooh, Hadrish has been nominated as successor. Wow. A knight without armor and a savage lamb. The stranger rode into a town clad in thick winter furs atop a hardy step pony, flanked by men with hard, lean faces. A rifle was slung over his shoulder, a mose and a gun kept in pristine condition, a pistol snug at his hip. The man of danger, this black rider was known to them through the new strand of folklore that had arisen in the wastes. His name was Elias Staranov, and his reputation preceded him. This was a man who had shot dead the infamous bandit Anatoly Sliv uh, Slivko, who had fought off Aryan Brotherhood at the gunfight at Salavat and had led ragtag militia bands to impossible victories over superior foes. The crowd watched and whispered, awed by his presence and what his sudden appearance here might mean. For his part, Staranov paid the crowd no mind, his eyes fixed on the little church that lay in the center of town. Standing in front of the church, one of the few Catholic churches in this part of the world, was Janis Mendrix. The aging priest was flanked by two of the zero guards, the men eyeing the gunfighter in his retinue with wary eyes. Staranov met the gaze of the Latvian Papas, and the two shared a smile. Staranov mounted, dismounted his pony, and his boots thumping into the fresh snow and setting a puff of white in the air. So this is the famous Janus Mendrix, the children of Orkuta. Looks like an old man and some nervous village boys to me, said Staranov, his glove finger pointing at Mendrix. Ilya Staranov, I presume? I thought I recognized you from the smell of old leather and cheap vodka that floated into town the second you crossed the border. Mendrix's eyes were steely and his mouth uh, set in a firm line. Both sets of bodyguards fingered their weapons nervously, and the townsfolk began to file away from the street. Attention evaporated Staranov's cracked smile. Janus, you son of a gun, how have you been? Mendrix laughed, and the guards relaxed as the two old warriors clasped hands in camaraderie. I understand you have plans to turn my little militia into a real fighting force, said I, said Mendrix, to which the old gunfighter grinned. Not just a real fighting force, Janus, the best darn soldiers in all of Russia. A chestnut of silver is his badge of trust. And we'll do that one in the refugees. Oh boy, we've got a refugee crisis here, huh? We're trying to make a military factory, because right now all we're making is artillery and guns, which are super important, but like, we need, we need anti-tank. Oh boy. And as you can see here, we can't raid. So, honestly, actually doing world development might not be too bad. Uh, it might not be great, but... Um, getting more infrastructure is not bad. 30% chance that nothing happens. Um, so there's a 70% chance something does happen, which is good. Um, is there really any point to do any of this stuff? Actually, training your troops might not be bad. Actually, that one... Well, of course we can get tool for leniency. Number of initiates, 60. You have 1,000 manpower, though. You know, I'm going to try this one. Give me the 1,000 manpower. We could really use it. Monsters in the smog. The Euroleague has been welcoming refugees for almost as long as it has existed. 
It's a founding principle of our alliance that we must shelter those who need it and defend those who are defenseless. In the past few months, however, they took trick all those forests from their homes and become a stream, which is becoming quickly becoming a flood. While those arriving from the south speak of an increase in the banned activity we've been battling against for years, the refugees from the east bring stories of a new threat. In hushed tones, they whisper of entire villages vanishing in the night. The houses and fields abandoned, their former inhabitants lost to the world. Rumors are spreading like the, the Black Mountain, long abandoned and forgotten, as stirring again the smog of its factories once more blackening Russia's skies. Some claim to have seen men wearing ghoulish suits and masks moving within the smoky haze, dragging their unsuspecting victims back to the mountaintop layer. As these disturbing reports increase both in quantity and severity, our eastern scouts have reported that the 22nd Motor Rifle Division, NKVD, has fortified the mountains around the old mining town of Magnitogorsk. The remnants or remains of the division are apparently acting under the direction of Trofim Lysenko, a popular scientist in the pre-war Soviet Union. Observation of the division has revealed that they have been reopening the mines and factories around the fabled Black Mountain, though their intentions are unknown as of now. The connection between Lysenko's appearance, reappearance, and these stories, it's impossible to miss. Our eastern scouts have already been ordered to continue their observation of the mountain to see what they can uncover. Additional guards have been recalled from their normal patrols to reinforce the dangers currently stationed in the east. For the moment, it is unknown why Lysenko's reopened the mountains and abducted those that once lived, but there we will soon find out. No question will go unanswered. No crime will go unpunished. As we'll read, the refugees. Across the league, refugees have been crossing our borders in droves. While our brave guards have made an effort to protect and serve those in need, even those outside our borders, the constant influx of the new miles of feet is straining our logistics. What? We are using valuable resources, a solid issue for when the resources, these resources themselves, can be used to prepare for the coming conflicts. Our enemies may take advantage of the situation and use it against us. We must find a solution to the crisis before it gets any worse. What remains? Many at home had warned them of what, what, uh, what they would see in the south, of what the Dovanga Brigade had done to so many villages. None within the young squad of scouts really understood what, that warning until they saw it with their very own eyes. When they came across the ruins of Bul Buzuluk, the sheer magnitude of what they were facing struck them to the very core, entering the ruined town. The smell of smoke and death was overpowering. This was a recent attack. Lost souls shifted through the streets, their clothes hanging by a thread, uh, eyes peering into nothingness. Women and children stared at them from half-destroyed homes with nothing but pain in their gaze. Casimir, one of the younger scouts, choked on what lay within the city square. A mound of bodies rotted there. Men, women, and children, alike of young and old faces, stripped of the clothes and valuables, the bandits never even had the decency to bury them. Casimir knelt and took into his hand one of theirs. He muttered something, perhaps a prayer, perhaps an apology. Then he rose, tears forming his eyes, but they could not mourn the loss forever. Then they came across a smoldering heap of wood and brick. An iron bell lay in the ashes. This was a church. Sifting through the rubble, one of the scouts suddenly flitched back, examining further the true horror of what they were witnessing unfolded beneath their suit cake boots. Piles upon biles of bones and skulls, charred black litter of the former church floor. Slowly they began to realize what had happened. The bandits had trapped these people inside the church and set it on fire. Together the scouts finally had come to grace, face the grim truth of their duties. Their war was not just against a pack of rowdy looters and bandits. Their war was against the face of evil itself and the very essence of human cruelty. They now realized that the true purpose to grant these souls the justice they deserve and to drag Dovanger's horde into heck itself, screaming, guns, labor, and bread. The early league existed protected citizens and communities from the many threats that surrounded them. Though many would have understood that this involved a great deal of fighting, most of these would not uh, oops, uh, have realized just how much paperwork those goals required, but Vasily Zatsyev certainly did. Apart from the League's member settlements, arrived every week, and he had noticed a worrying trend. Many of the communities were extremely poor, still organized along Tsar's era of China practices, and the ever-present stream of refugees that was straining their resources to the breaking point. Something had to be done, and something would be. Zatsyev had been thinking for some time, and he concluded that centralization was the only reasonable answer. He would ask Mendrix to use his popularity to appeal to the communities, encouraging them to extend the Uralian commonality to those new arrivals. At the same time, he would incentivize such action beyond mere goodwill by extending subsidies to places that did so. Green supplies would be redirected in order to ensure sufficient food supply in the stressed regions. Finally, some of the League's militias would be rebased from the camps to the villages and towns affected by those other actions, moving to serve as a combination of protective force and town watch. Though he knew that there would be no problems and disagreements with his choices, Zestiev was confident that in time all would understand that the League was only taking an active role in the protection and community continued safety. United we stand, divided we fall. Staring down the devil. Oh, hello. Wait. When did we start getting raided here? Uh, well, that's crap. Move, move, move! What are you doing? Get in there! Holy crap! That is, this is not good. I will we'll read this in a second, but um, are we really gonna lose here? Are we really gonna lose? This is this is garbage, dude. How are we supposed to know when we're gonna get raided? We're not even, we don't have any loot. We have like no manpower too. But staring down the devil. 
Gangs, warlords, and mad scientists, the threats of the Euroleague are many, yet one stands above the others. A band of savages fallen into the general Delvanger, pre referred to as the Black Bandits by most as the A-Holes by the Guard, present the most immediate pressing danger to the southern Russia. This loose assembly of German war criminals, the Russian bandits, and the Kazakh raiders have grown to be the largest army in the region, and their violent debauchery is almost single-handedly responsible for the refugee crisis that has put us in such a precarious situation. Even worse, should the bandits continue to grow in strength, they could soon be bold enough to mount a full attack in the League. We are in strong spirits, but few in number, and we are already struggling to defend our borders. Should Delvanger invade, it may be the end of everything we've worked so hard to build. It has been said of that, with the Black Bandits representing the greatest threat to peace and stability in the area, what scant few man resources we have available will be concentrated in the south to prepare for the coming war. It has also been recommended that the people of the Southern Urals under our protection be organized into militias to supplement our forces to off help offset the numerical disparity between our enemies and observers and ourselves. This has become a topic of fierce debate, as some commanders feel that without the militias, our defeat is inevitable, while others believe that creating them would be kind of using those we have sworn to protect as meat shields. Either way. Time is running short. The Bandit King is gathering his strength, and his lust for wealth and violence must be sated soon, and it is well known that he is not a patient man. Let the demons come, we'll send them right back to heck. Yeah, this is garbage. What the heck? Why do you suck so much, Zatsyev? Bro. How much manpower do you have? Three to four thousand. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, we're gonna lose this one. Oh, we're absolutely gonna lose. Look at that. They're literally killing off divisions right now. That's such crap. Eyes on the south. Though Lysenko and his inhumane experiments is morally appalling, Dovalin and the 36th SS are a far more urgent threat. Slaughtering his way from the Berlin to the Urals, it's only a matter of time before the Black Bandit aims to sight on us. For the sake of our nation, for the sake of our people, we must, and for the sake of the Russians everywhere, we must stop out this black stain before it's too late. The Refugee Crisis. The Ural League's role is defined by our leader, Father Janus Mendrix, <clears throat> is to be a light to shining in the darkness, a great beacon of hope for the people stricken by so much tragedy. The most significant way we have been performing this role is in the special care we are giving the numerous refugees coming into our lands. The Ural's the League's territory is an oasis of peace among the lawless lands that stretch for hundreds of miles. So it's natural that thousands of people are fleeing from the countless horrors of uh, uh, the hinterland arrive constantly at our doorstep. Most of the time they bring nothing but fear, hate, and anger with them. An incredible number of displaced men and women arriving daily is stretching already with some rations. On different routine uh, frontline detachments, our supplies are on such low level that the guards are sharing food, latrines, and even blankets with hopeless, hopeless refugees to protect them from the cold death on the hinterlands. The scale of the refugee wave will soon cause a crisis in the League's territory. Commanders will, are coming up with plans to deal with this issue. Their lack of fortune is reminiscent of what we endured in Vorkutin and through our long march, so abandoning these huddled men and women is not an option. We, what we must do is devise means to turn these hopeless masses into useful laborers and soldiers of the League. How long can we keep this up? Man, that sucks so hard. Holy crap. Maybe I chose the wrong general, but... Jesus Christ, that's so stupid. We've been raided. Uh, we worry about that. Please go right ahead. Dear God, we lose some stuff, but we never had stuff to begin with, so whatever. We're gonna need more guns. Wow, that's so god-awful. Holy crap. Yeah, this is terrible. Hmm... We need more guns. I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, I don't mind doing that one. Maybe more army XP. Um, You guys suck. Some of you guys really suck, and you deserve to lose, because you suck so badly. <laughs> the Garrison Slider going about that, please go ahead. Oh my god, that sucks. But then again, oh well, that doesn't hurt us terribly, 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 terribly. Um, ask for a meeting, Orenberg. Honestly, I kind of want to meet with Orenberg. That'd be pretty good. Disgruntled veterans, we get more population to use. Way more division training time, though. We get more attack and defense, that's good, though. <clears throat> oh, Spartan Dis- We go with Spartan Discipline. Wow. Get more attack and defense, period. To upgrade our militia forces using- Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Study of tactics. I w do want to watch your troops, though. Um, use a lot of people population factor, but you do get more attack and defense. Uh... <clears throat> Let's do the militia option. For our guards make up the finest fighting force in all of Russia, however, we don't have the numbers to fight a sustained conflict. Our enemies are numerous, and there isn't enough men in our ranks to fight them at this time. We must raise the militias to bolster our forces and guarantee our victory. The people of the Urals must rise to the occasion and answer the call. Eskulpeleni. <clears throat> Whenever Yanis Mendrix spoke at his services, the children of Vorkuta always knew the poetic quality of his voice. How every word of his sermons painted a holy image so vivid and rhapsodic that it felt as if they were spoken by the Lord himself. The priest knew from the years he spent studying theology how to convey the human spirit through the, through the Latvian and Russian languages. Today he's finally authored a poem collection titled Redemption, and sent the first copy to the printing presses of the Euroleague. Years and years of sporadic writings on the subject of faith, persistence, and survival. The ancient Slavic traditions of poetry were preserved here through imagery and verse, excerpting, excerpting one particularly relevant passage. 
Yet, as we stand here stranded, surrounded by those entrenched in sin, the call of Russia shall surpass what they've done, our faith and only strengthens with him. Although the intellectual community and the youth throughout the league have celebrated the publication, the irreligious, irreligious and more militant living within our borders have most ignored the event. Time will tell if it will become a classic, or Mendrix will be forgotten like thousands of other minor poets. Perhaps the southern heroes will predestined for poetry. Oh, we can resettle these guys, huh? <clears throat> the Black State. While patrolling the southern hinterlands, one of our scouts spotted what they had not seen in years. The round helmets and gray uniforms of the darn German invaders. The experienced leader of the unit correctly ordered his men to conduct an ambush and even managed to secure a few prisoners to our HQ, which was promptly placed on higher alert for the German military, as marching in a region. <clears throat> When interrogating the captives, it was discovered that these men were not carrying orders from the Fuhrer, but were part of the infamous 36 Waffen SS Grenadier Division, led by Oscar Delvanga, made up of rapists, murders, and other scum of German society. Uh, they were the uh, Nazis' favorite attack dog, and the terror of many innocent Russian families that but stopped following Berlin's orders during the West Russian War and now only answer to their devilish commander. Testimony given to us by the refugees arriving each day tells of the sheer vileness of these men. Tales of torture, rip, and, uh, oh boy, murder for a sport of defenseless women and children are spreading through our ter territory and camps, like wildfire by the families fleeing the Black Brigade's terror. Many are calling for the guard to act and stop this terrible threat. Further scouting is detected that the brigade is now based around Orsk. Reconnaissance photos coupled with the interrogations. Uh, <clears throat> oh crap, I just lost my place. Uh, uh, yeah, with interrogations of captured brigade elements have indicated that the Drovanga is on an arms and soldier procurement spree, attracting villains from every corner of the land with the promise of power, riches, and women. It is clear that he intends to continue his reign of terror. We must be ready. Actually, let's start doing the land auction too, because that'll be important. Strategic theory, more entrenchment. We need that. We absolutely have to have that. But approach survivalists, issue the headcount. In order to call upon the militia, the census must be made. Our administrators shall travel all across the league to conduct this great task. All able-bodied men that are called upon will take up arms to join the militia. These men shall help to strengthen our forces and ensure that there are no gaps in our line. The Lushy. or Lishi. Oh, okay, wait. Why can we build new schools? Wait, what? Wait, why do we have that option? And seriously, we lost a division here. We lost a little militia division. So, honestly... Uh, just do that. There you go. Aldo felt his boot catch a rock as he ran and was propelled to the ground, kept breaking a tooth. Holding back his sleeve to, the, uh, to clot the blood now trickling from his cane, his canine. The SS trooper staggered to his feet. Where the heck did heaven go? He muttered. The fear in his voice poorly disguised and his SS standard false bravado. They had only been a relatively simple slave raid, he and his unit, until Hans had stepped on <clears throat> something and was abruptly pulled by his neck into a tree with a sickening crack. Bullets flew as chaos erupted in their patrol, though Otto had seen little of it, and as he as three others fled the scene like scared mice, of course. By the time they were out of the pass, it was only him, Herman, and the oldest man of the unit, Albrecht. The other man, Gunther, had disappeared into the bush, as if grabbed by its very branches, dragging him off into oblivion. During their mad dash to God knows where, taking shelter by a tree, Albrecht had his squadmates a very harrowing, if implausible, explanation. The Leshy, an ancient Slavic forest spirit, tricky but vengeful. That was when things had taken a turn for the worst. As if by the wrath of Russia itself, a terrible creaking heralded the woods themselves coming alive. Albrecht had finally suddenly fallen, and with a girlish cry was pulled back at such a rapid speed. He appeared to disappear for a moment before being consumed by a gaping hole in the ground. Otto and Herman had taken no chance and fled in the opposite directions. Now Otto was slink slinking warily down an unfamiliar path, bleeding from the mouth. It saw it once again stopped as something snapped beneath his foot. Gazing down, he only saw a twig. Glancing up once again, however, he found himself staring into the eyes of Herman as the dude hung upside down from a tree, disemboweled his mouth agape. Otto just heard so something muttering in Russia, and he turned on his heel just in time to catch a speeding bullet in the chest. The hero guardsman pulled down the hood of his ghillie suit, chuckling. Just me, flattering you thought I was Lishi, though. Flattering. Like, don't get me wrong, I want to do this stuff, but... <clears throat> Can we really afford to fight these guys? Our division's kind of suckery now. Look how weak we are. Look how incredibly weak our divisions are. Would there be any way we could actually beat these guys? These are like 18 or 20 combo with, with support artillery. I think it's just best to wait. Just wait. I want to raid so badly, but... And did we get that 1,000 manpower yet? We must have. Oh my goodness. Raising the volunteer guards. The arguments have come to an end. And a consensus has been reached. The high command of the Euro League are all practical individuals. We have to be to make it this far. Like it or not, the reality of the situation is that the guard alone will not be enough to stop Drovanga's brigade and bandits. Especially if Lysenko continues to press us as well because of this. It's been decided that people of the Urals must be called to action and the militias must be formed. While the militias will provide a much needed source of manpower to augment the small size of the standing guard, few of our generals are happy. Most of the people of these mountains have seen little combat, so it's been decided that the militias will only consist of those who have fought before, or who have talents and skills that would lend themselves to warfare. 
He moved the stipulation in place. Our commanders are reluctant to send those who have fought or thought they'd managed to escape war back onto the battlefield after living in peace for so long. For years, the quiet, sheltered lives of the inhabitants of the Southern Urals have been a point of pride for us, proof of our effectiveness in defending our adopted home. Now, a time has come where we must disturb the peace we have worked so hard to create and must prepare those we have protected to be thrown back into the danger once again. Mothers and fathers, husbands and wives will all be called to leave upon behind the lives they had worked so hard to rebuild, to fight against the darkness one last time, defend their home, to do all that must be done. We must be willing to sacrifice everything to do what is right and approach as survivalists. The hero guard will make men and children, but those who go even further into the cold are made into animals. These survivalists are masters of their surroundings, capable of traveling great distances while living off the land. These men are incredibly valuable to our fledgling militia. Let us recruit them into our ranks and have them from the form the core of one of our initial divisions. Lower training standards. Mm. I don't want to lower that, but we lose 20 army XP. Well, what, what can we do with army XP if we, you know, at all, like with no supplies? We only got 45 more. Dang it. That's not enough. <sighs> it's not enough. And there's, a lot, there's been a lot of reading so far, which is not bad, but. I got guns. Oh, Tiller's looking okay ish. Even getting a word of one division is still not a bad idea. Because look how strong these guys are. And we need that manpower. We absolutely need that manpower. Are we going to resell the refugees? Honestly, you know, we might as well. 2,000 more manpower is going to be really useful. Alright. And we're doing this just because I want to get that uh, attack and defense buff just in case. Staying at attention. In the field outside of the small town of Sim, a small crowd is gathered in the pre-dawn gloom. A motley crew of men ranging from their early 20s to their late 40s stand in loose formation as a man in a tattered uniform carrying a clipboard walks amongst them, asking each individual for the same three things, name, and age, and address. Once he has conducted this brief interview with each member of the crowd, he returns to the front and stares down at this clipboard, muttering under his breath, 31, 32, 33 in total. That's actually more than I would expect from a village of the size. Well, everyone, given the circumstances, there is really no need for formalities. As I'm sure you are all aware, the Euro League has sent out the call for formations of militias to deal with this increased in bandit activity and the refugee crisis. All you have the skills and experiences we are looking for, and you have shown that you already possess the fearless and altruistic spirit of the guard by volunteering to defend your homeland. Before we go any further, I should ask how many of you have your own rifles? About half the crowd raise their hands, while a few others display the rifles they brought with them to the assembly. The census taker does a quick count and scribbles down something in his notes. Good. Very good. Excellent, in fact. Those of you who don't, don't worry. We'll take care of that as soon as well as ammo and uniforms once we get to Ust Katalov. That's all I have to say. Remember to have your belongings packed and your goodbye said by 11.30. The convoy is leaving at noon and we won't be coming back for any stragglers, so you have to find your way down south. Once again, I applaud all of you for joining the militia. The League thanks you, and the Guard thanks you, and the people of Russia thank you for your bravery. True heroes of the heroes, one and all. Yeah, I got slightly more manpower, which is nice, but still. And experimental cadet squads. The Euro Guard make up the best of the best of forces, and they are seen as an inspiration of many militiamen. Why not use them to train the militia? They have the talent to whip our militia into true fighting force and give Drobling a run for his money. We'll give the Guard whatever they need to train them. The Babyash Camino militia meet their wild man. Fyodor Egorov had been excited when he was appointed by the Euro Guard to command the newly formed militia when he had technically served in the Red Army during the West Russian War. He had just been a boy then, and the war came to an end before he even reached the front line. The militia, this militia, will be his chance to prove himself and show his worth as a man. It was an unpleasant surprise when he was told that a survivalist was being sent into town to help train the militia. As far as Fyodor was concerned, his men knew everything they needed to, and some hillbilly from the wastelands would be more of a burden than anything else. When the man finally arrived, all the militia men couldn't help but stare. His beard wasn't as long as they joked about it would be, but it wasn't short. What was the most surprising about him was his age. None of the men dared ask, but there was no question that this man had seen Russia collapse not once, but at least twice. I'd enjoy speaking, so you children should listen. I've been living off the lamp for longer than any of you have been alive. When I was 17, the Reds burned my home and forced me into the world. I spent the next 20 years hunting, scavenging, and killing any Red who tried to stop me. Then the Nazis came. So I spent the next 20 years killing Nazis. Now they're bandits, and I don't have 20 more years left of me. That's where you lot come in. After 40 years in the forest, you learn a thing or two, and I aim to teach you what I know. I know how to find food even when the worms have abandoned it. I know how to find and remove so quietly that even a rat won't hear me approaching. I know how to survive in a blizzard without a blanket and how to lure a wolf pack into an enemy patrol. By the time I'm done with you all, you will not know how to do most of this, uh, but you will know enough to die fighting rather than freezing and starving, and that's what your people ask of you. Perhaps you may be useful after all. Oh, recon company. And there goes all that manpower we just got. All right. Uh, expand the program? Yeah, let's do this one. With the guard having trained our militia to fight with their tactics, the time's coming to ramp up the program. Those who are trained by the guard will become drill sergeants and instructors for the newer recruits. Also, help increase our efficiency in fighting strength. At this stage, the militia will be able to stand toe to toe with any enemy in the Southern Urals. Upgrade militia forces. Allows us to handle 200 more initiates and get some more XP. That's really cool. Anything else here? Um, we can still raid more, but whatever. Up to 600, of course. Anything else? Oh, 
We're going to need to lower our standards. We can get more guys here, too. So, Oh, so we'll get some more map art in a few days. Okay, good. All right, all right. Expand the program. Familiar connections. Ooh, ooh, that's going to be really strong to get. Like veterans land for construction speed plus six percent, which we do need. Um, exploiter initiates even more. A well-paying job. Um, it's not bad. Healthy rations. Good friends. What? Two-year draft? With one-year draft? Huh? And we don't have any debuffs there. To manpower? Okay. That's not bad either. Oh, we get even more population. Let's do familiar connections just in case. No man is an island. Every one of our soldiers is someone's son, father, husband, brother, cousin, friend. While most of these family members and refugees are not apt to perform at combat roles, they should not be discharged as auto mouths to feed and could be proven useful assets to our guard. Every man we keep in the front lines needs countless others in the rear guard as support staff, cooks, logistics, uniform sewing, equipment repair, and much more. All these roles could easily be fulfilled by the family members and acquaintances of our men provided with only a small amount of training and orientation. This way we can free up valuable training and experienced guards from those support roles and deploy them straight into combat duty where they are needed the most, strangers out of the cold. The guards stare at the gawky man. And this female god, not entirely sure what to make of him. The pair of bundled in thick winter coats, the hard face. A woman carrying a scoped rifle, the glasses of the man fogged beyond sight. We seek entry to your land, said the woman in clipped Russian. My name is Zoya, and this man is Steve. Upon hearing his name, the man waved to the guards, who then exchanged looks. The guard eyed the strange pair warily, to make sure that the man posed no threat, but the woman radiated uh, daily poise. Finally, when the guard spoke up, are you refugees? We have plenty of warm food and... No, 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 said the woman. We're not refugees. A look of confusion passed between the sentinels, and the second guard replied. Then what are you? Then what are you? What are you, are you looking for employment? Mercenaries? The woman, Zoya, smiled, her lips twisting her wind-burnt face. We're not refugees or mercenaries, comrades, we're tourists. The guard didn't know what to make of this, but waited the pair to follow them back towards the Sibay. Tourists? Who the heck would be crazy enough to tourists at the southern year olds? Wait until Star enough hears about this. Morning, a comrade. Guardsman Alexei was one of the bravest, hardest-working, fighting soldiers and his fellow squad members had known. They looked up to him, and he looked after them in turn. They had all sworn to do everything to protect each other, even if it killed them. Dozens of times, they had kept their word, taking wounds and facing hardships together. Alexei, more than all others, but he didn't consider himself superior. He may have been stronger and with a keener aim, but the, the others fought with all they could give, and what was enough. And that was enough. Finally, the day came, and Alexei fulfilled his oath for the last time. In an act of supreme heroism, he ran to the grenade which had been thrown inside the house. They were defending and launched himself on it, covering his comrades with his body. The funeral service, at his prayer's request, was sure and quiet. His reposed body was dressed in the uniform, to which his commanding officer had pinned the posthumous medal. Then the coffin was hauled out by his squadmates and lowered into the hole into the ground. As one of the soldiers began filling the hole with dirt, a priest read from the Bible and said something nice about him. Then the squ uh, squad sergeant uh, came forward and spoke, telling funny stories about him, like his attempts to hit on uninterested women, or the times he would get pissed drunk and laugh so loudly he would wake up the entire barracks from his sleep, from their sleep. Some laughed at this, but most cried, uh, miserable at the thought that their friend was no longer with them. Finally, the hole was replaced by a small earth mound, and the sergeant played a short rendition of Katyushka, his favorite song, with all soldiers forming the choir, and they all left, take, talking among themselves or staying quiet. What a darn shame, the sergeant muttered under his breath. He will be missed. The militia system training the militias. Lose, oh, when selected, we lose army XP. Oh, the militia pro program has been expanded. Modify it with more light infantry attack and defense. Oh, we just got rid of our light infantry. God dang it. <laughs> Lower training standards. Um, Go up to 800. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, we can ref oh, we can oh, we can do this again and again and again. Okay, that's not bad. Um, I don't like militia. I really don't. We already we got rid of our militia because these guys are all normal infantry. These guys are like militia, light infantry. Oh, is it worth even using them? I'm not really sure. I don't want to lose that army XP right now. I'd rather lose army XP doing this. Give you more recruits. I think up next, what we should do... Let's see, anything here interesting? Oh, Entry 22, snug in a bunker. Um, Max planning does go down. You get more organization, which is pretty good. And, yeah, that's not bad. But over here, shortcomings, rifles, land auction. Land auction would be really good. Line infantry. Line infantry speed. Snug in a bunker. When I went behind the walls of Sibay, the last thing I expected out of this bunker was coziness. I'll please report that my quarters are clean and comfortable and they even have eating. Also, by Russians and other communities at the Southern Year Olds was a heck hole, but honestly, I can't see it. Everyone is so friendly, the food is good, and some of the guard even know some English. Even Zoya's loosening up a bit. She's been spending a lot of time with this Zatsiev guy, and I think he's used to be a sniper too. I managed to find myself a friend too, his name is Pavel. Good guy. Around my age, smokes back a day in a surprisingly soft singing voice in spite of it. Me and him were talking the other night about the Southern Year Olds, and I got asking him why he's such a bad reputation. Steve, he said to me in his broken, thickly accented English, the Year keeps people safe behind walls with guns. Outside walls, there's coal and many bandits. 
I asked him how the other communities in the Urals managed and if he would be recommend where I should go next, and he said, No place, get out of the Urals. Orsk is a bandit country run by King Rapist. Magnotogorsk, even worse, crazy scientists in charge there. No one ever leave. Nuremberg, full of stupid wastes of time. I guess the other territories are as bad as Pavel says. No wonder Sebe is a bunker city. I should ask Zoya about it. She seems to know a little bit about everything. Is his name actually King Rapist? <laughs> That's funny. Is it actually King Rapist? Yes. Yes. Train to cooperate with Orenberg. It's not bad. Teach artisans. Orenberg equipment. Army. Hmm. I should know no fear. Oh, let's do Sarnoff's proposal. After learning of the dangers that the region is facing, a man named Ilya Sternov approached the Euroleague's commanders with a plan. Formerly, a colonel in the Red Army with a strong proponent of utilizing extremely well-trained forces in asymmetric warfare. This veteran of the Patriotic War has been traveling the wastes. Sternov is a mercenary, offering his services to the highest bidder, training villages to defend them for themselves in return for food and shelter. Now, as he enters his sixth decade, the colonel decided that his nomadic existence must finally end. Starnoff had a detailed plan to transform our already elite guard into a force unrivaled in the post-Soviet hellscape. They'll be able to scavenge and fight it well away from a supply train and on any kind of battlefield. The Trojan of Orkuta will soon become the most powerful fighting force in all of Russia, capable of easily crushing Lysenko's NKVD and Dervanger's SS. Well, we'll see. Lobby for leniency. 515 is not bad. We're going to keep raising it up if we possibly can. Um, I don't want to lo lower the herd amount of guns we got, so we're going to wait. Yeah, might as well wait. <clears throat> Familiar collection connection, so we get even more manpower. Or, no, not more manpower, but, like, defense. Oh, the volunteer thing. Okay, that's really bad. No wonder we lost. Uh, t take stock of our shortcomings. Colonel Sternoff has scheduled a meeting with all of the League's field commanders. He and a small team of his close advisors, all of his companions since the Patriotic War, visited each and every frontline unit of the Guard, having long conversations with the foot soldiers in the trenches. The advisors even encountered the enemy numerous times to see how their men performed under fire. Before implementing his numerous reforms to increase our soldiers' performance in combat, Ilya Sternov wants to inspect the extent of our situation to the smallest detail. This includes their full stock of arms and ammo, the number of soldiers deployed to the front lines, and their individual and group performance. Only by taking notice of our shortcomings and understanding our strength can we improve the guard. Absolutely. I want to improve society, but... I don't think we can, man. A new home. After years of overwhelming fear, the road beckoned, open road beckoned to Anatoly. The brief interactions with strangers, the kindness and anger that accompanied anonymity. What Anatoly did not miss was the cold. When the winter bit on the tundra, he lost friends and toes, but through it all, he was still, he was still far better than his former home. Colonia was no place no man deserved, reminiscent of the devil's icy resting place. If anyone had read Dante's Inferno, it would remind him of Kaina. The frozen land of Cain and his fellow traitors, where the darn endured eternal cold without the freedom of death. It was the past, but the past never faded, and Anatoly had done things in those frozen camps that made him shiver from something completely unrelated to the cold chilling him to the bone. Outside the walls lay little. The Cajun nomad, nomad, cold and distant, offered little more than soup and bread, and ruins were all he could see by the old road, slowly going south. Some semblance of civilization returned, and with it, humanity. Bandits and criminals, thieves and beggars, but at least he could find shelter from the cold. Anatoly dimly recalled the eastwards that there was an ocean in China. Westwards, maybe a Russia state lied. Perhaps more humane than the old Union, the old man resolved to march towards the saying sun. Whether by his own perception or by the Earth's movements, the day got longer. His days got longer. There was no longer snow, and wheat shone gold on the horizon. A fire somewhere out there glowed every night. It was on the one long day that Anatoly arrived at a small village somewhere high in the Urals. The guards, hardened by the life outside the comforts of the developed world, asked for identification. When Anatoly expressed that he lacked any, they asked him for his tail then, and the man began from the distant past inside the camps to the more recent years in the wild Russian, wild Russian East. Upon hearing about his time in the Gulag, they beckoned him into the guard post and poured a glass of vodka for him. Only the bravest survived the camps, and Anatoly was one of them. Following a hearty shot of the poisonous fluid, the guards led him to... A soldier, clad in an old uniform, his hands stained with dirt and his eyes wrinkled, the soldier called out, Welcome home, brother! Experimental training methods. On the battlefield, might makes right. The correct application of deadly force is the only way to victory and to guarantee yourself, uh, uh, the survival of yourself, your comrades, and the safety of your people. Steranov's harsh training methods will instill his maxim in the head of each and every recruit, prioritizing organization, movement, speed, and above all, aggression. The new Euro Guard will weed out most of the recruits, but those su who successfully complete their training will be strong men capable of handling everything our enemies throw at us. Sweat saves blood, and with Steranov's methods, we can create soldiers worthy of the moniker, the children of Rokota. Steranov's proposal. <clears throat> The Euro Guard already holds the title of the toughest soldiers in Russia, forged in the nightmare of the gulags, tempered in the chaos of the collapsing Union, and tested daily in the anarchy of the Southern Urals. We prove our worth and ability time and time again, and soon yet we might not be enough. As the guardians of the mountains, we have faced long odds before, but this time it is different. Dovanga's bandits are the largest and most sadistically violent group to have ever threatened the region, far surpassing any of the wannabe warlords and nomadic thugs that we have wrangled with before. The few soldiers that Lysenko does have are possibly the most best weapon in all of Russia, armed with newly made machine guns and armor-piercing ammo, while our men fight with 
hunting rifles and scavenging bullets. Those two threats may prove to be the first and last enemies of the Euro League cannot stop unless something is to be done soon. It is with this reasoning that the Colonel Ilya Steranov has presented his plan reform for the Euro Guard. While many have advocated for the Guard's uh, recruiting standards to be lowered, allowing more men in and increasing the size of the army we can wield, Steranov's plan calls for the exact opposite. He argues that the Guard has not gone far enough in cultivating its elite status and must reform itself in what would be the most well-trained force of not only Russia but the world. He calls for a new training regimen that would, in his words, ideally disqualify 70-85% to 85 of the trainees before completion. This training would include spending weeks in the wilderness, surviving off of nothing more than what they can find, being drilled endlessly on conventional combat, guerrilla combat, urban combat, close quarters combat, nighttime combat, and any other type of combat that the instructors could think of. But simply, may we put through a training so difficult that those who come out on the other side will see real war as a relief. Certainly interesting. Oh, who died? Ah, uh, Guiana. The first batch boot camp. Fegorov glared at his men. They were a motley bunch, young and old, muddled together in a days of cocky and scraped together uniforms, but they were what they had. Training wasn't going to be easy on them, but these people had signed up to defend their piece of Russia uh, from the chaos outside. They had nothing, if not courage, and courage. It was what the Euro Guard asked for, and not skill nor strength. He yelled, hand-to-hand -hand combat, begin! The militiamen and women took to each other with gusto, fists flying, nodding with approval of Figurov. Well, the ranked walked among the ranks, giving complimentary commentary on fighting technique. Ivana, watch your side. Nikolai, stop manhandling him and take him down. Not Talia. I swear to the living God that if you try to grow up your opponent, I will fire you. <laughs> the old knowledge flowed back to him from the days, those days in the Soviet boot camp, and it felt satisfying. It was truly a soldier, he thought, and a part of him chuckled ruefully at that. Later that afternoon, looking over statistics and tables, Flegorov began his report to the Central Command of the League. Massive improvements have been made, he noted, in the fighting capacities of his men, it appeared. The training regiment was working. <clears throat> Our response to the senior advisors had been especially positive and even affectionate, although discipline continued to be something of an issue. He paused at the final point. His report called for a final decision on whether to expand the program with the Roth conscription measures. It was drastic, but the Euros were an extreme place. He took a deep breath and wrote his response. I recommend the expansion of training intakes for the glory of the motherland and for the good of Russia. May God prove my decision right. The first wave of many. We got a few artillery pieces. I don't know if we can do this. I mean, it will give us... Uh, do it anyway. Screw it. Just because it gives us a little bit more firepower here. And we might be able to make enough artillery, maybe. Uh, lower training standards. I want to do that. We have only six. So now I don't feel so bad about doing this. If we do it anyway, so. That'll be good. I don't get more army XP anyway, so. Cock has been wounded. Cool. Preparing for war. Starting off has completed his audit of our resources and discovered that we maintain a surplus. A surplus of anything outside suffering is rare in the Russian wilderness and wasteland, so we must choose wisely on how to best invest it. Firstly, we can maintain our current training regimen while also refining the older tactics still used by our specialist units. Sweeping reform of the guard will cost us a surplus, but it will save a good, great deal of blood. Second, we can enlarge our training facilities and up our recruitment campaigns, filling out the gaps in our ranks. Finally, we can simply invest in high-quality weapons. We have relied on local gunsmiths and caravans for far too long. Deploying our troops with modern effective equipment, be it small arms, supported gear, or artillery, will dramatically improve the combat effectiveness and reduce the battlefield injuries. A newly made grenade will not explode randomly, after all. Training? Never enough men. Well, none of these are really that appealing, I'll be honest. Um, Army speed would be good for this, maybe. Well, actually, not really. I want more men, but we're doing pretty darn well with this, actually. I think so. Guns are not bad, too. Um, go with army XP for now. I want to get more bonuses to land auction quickly, though. Uh, well, we have what we have. The purpose of the Euro Guards is to give battle to the enemy and protect the innocent people of Russia. For our purposes, it is indispensable that we have functioning weapons, despite our superior training, though a guard with just a knife cannot hold back the bandit flood. It is of the utmost importance for every member of the Guard to keep his weapon in pristine functioning condition. A significant portion of our arsenal is composed of high, hopelessly outdated firearms like old Russian rifles and submachine guns made by local gunsmiths nicknamed Dude Guns by our men. This reinforces the importance of daily maintenance and intensive care our guards must give to their weapons. The Euro League does not possess the necessary resources for modern weapons, and having any of our pieces fall in, fail in the field would likely mean a preventative death. The Call to Arms uh, like a vine cluster on a fallen log, the lonely village clung to your life on the outskirts of the Urals. No outsider could have told you its name, and all who needed to know it were so intimate with the town that the need for names had passed. The name of the village became half forgotten, half lost amidst the chatter of the infrequent merchant convoys, and the boys yelling at each other in the square. Under the casual intimacies of a lifestyle which had little need for the rest of the world, it had gently drifted into the ease of isolation as a couple slips into each other's familiar hollows in the warm darkness of the night. But any pawn will tell you that the piece of stillness is only a ripple away from the ending. 
from ending period. And day by day, the ripples expanded with a visits of soldiers and a single and double. The low growl of troops, uh, movements, exercise, recruitment, drives. Slowly, the games of boys changed from tag and catch to cops and robbers, soldiers and cowboys, hunted and hunted. The headman of the town smiled a little less at each monthly meeting, and the piles of paperwork on his desk slipped a little further into chaos every week. An old man woke dr sweat drenched at random intervals on quiet nights, reaching for guns long vanished from the households and farms, and other spouses as a shaking overtook them. Tattered red flags were dug up, glared at, and quickly re reburied, along with other, all other wel unwelcome ghosts. One morning, the ripples, with an uneasy inevitability, reached a town and broke its silence forever. A single walker yelling in a strange dialect from the nor up north, Come serve our brothers and sisters of the Euro League. All labeled by a young man from a household of more than four months, or four mouths. Mothers held their sons sobbing in the swirl of the Euro breeze, as the future hit that half-shrouded town, and no one knew what would leave in its wake. Come back to us soon, son. Come back soon. Ooh, quite a bit of arming speed. Um, yeah, that's not good, huh? I don't want any more army XP we can, but we gotta wait, I guess. We have what we have, my friends. We have what we have. Hundreds of trappers. That's not bad. Oh, very cool. Is there any tactics? Yeah, probably. But Gary goes in isolation. More line doctrine. The keystone of Ilya Sterenov's plan for reform of the Euro Guard is centered on small units' tactics. The old veteran firmly believes that a small and cohesive team working like clockwork could easily dispatch a much larger enemy force with less tactical organization and tactical study. Implementation and training are mandatory for every guard from the lowest private to the highest ranking commander. Every one of our guards should be a proficient in small unit tactics, including fire and move, L-shaped ambushes, trench assaults, long-range patrols, enveloping maneuvers and other stratagems, tied and tested by Steranov and his many years of fighting the German invader. He promotes his tactics as force multipliers, with a proper application making a squad capable of defeating a force ten times their number. If my soldiers were to think. The year old training procedure has drawn much criticism within our administration. Most troops are constantly drilled throughout the day. Uh, uh, getting at best a six hours of sleep at night. They have a ten minute break for each meal and only once at a close, which makes drilling even more rigorous. And if they have any free time at all, it's spent preparing for the next day of drilling. Despite these conditions, no one was expecting what happened last morning at 7.30. See you, kid. Gerasim, Georgi failed report for duty. Leading to a drill instructor's Salva Belov to the search room. Another ten minutes passed before the drill was interrupted from the round uh, sound of two rounds going off in the barracks. Officers and soldiers rushed inside to find the officer lying dead, and Sian Ken pointed the rifle's barrel to his mouth. With more than 50 spectators, the soldiers then pulled the trigger. The incident shocked the nation, and today newspapers are filled with analyses and critiques. But many still defend the Spartan conditions of the soldiers. They believe that the people of the Urals need to make sacrifices in order to protect themselves from foreign threats. However, there have been those who disagree, stating that what happened yesterday will happen more and more times as recruits are driven mad from fatigue and stress while their officers enjoy much better standards in difficult times. Even eating fresh bread instead of flavorless soup can drive men insane with robbery. They argue there's no use in constant drilling and the soldiers will later ignore orders or worse, revolt or simply kill themselves. Whatever stance people have taken on the issue is certainly becoming divisive. An absolute tragedy. Now we can do this. And get a flat 2000. Or we keep going this way. And eventually we get even more and more and more and more. So we still get 1.46. So let's do this one first. I want to max it out first and then we'll do some more of that stuff down here. So Study tactics, yes. Um, land auction is going to be super, 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 super important. We haven't got enough guns. I mean, we're making an okay -ish amount. We need more artillery and anti-tank, but what else is new? How's that coming along? That factor is not coming along very nicely. Oh, crap. Line infantry speed, line attack and defense. Let's at least get this one first. Fight like demons. Steranov's experience shows that in the face of dire and overwhelming odds, a soldier can only count on his will to live and fighting spirit. In the newly training regiment, the first few weeks will be composed of only testing of the recruits' willpower. In the middle of the night, flash grenades and tear gas canisters taken from the Vorkutlog will be thrown into the training sleeping quarters. After this rough awakening, they have had their packs filled with rocks and taken on an uphill run through the Ural Mountain lasting all day. After returning from this exhausting circuit and withstanding cold, hunger, and sleep deprivation, every Ural could be taken alone to room N in the call of Steranov be attacked by a dozen veteran guards. This impossible fight is made to the test of cadets' will to see if he is capable of fighting like a demon even when he's sure that he will lose. A few pass the test will begin in a warm meal and a comfortable bed to rest, even before they're taken advanced up to combat training. While those who fail are sent home. Gotta do what you gotta do. Max it out, max it out. Even though we still have 40 army XP. But, and uh, ask for a meeting. Our strong sense of duty towards protecting the common and downtrodden folk of the chaotic Urals has extended towards the communes of Orenburg, a region that prioritizes freedom over efficiency to an extreme degree. However, our elite forces are only able to hunt down so many of Drovanga's bandits, defend locations from only so many looters, and prepare only so much for the darker forces of Lysenko. We need to organize a meeting with legitimate representatives from the communes, in such a fashion that the uh, suspicious elements in the council can rest assured that their priority is saving lives. The lo few local militias they formed will not be able to secure even the villages in infection matter, an effective matter, let alone Orenburg itself.
health. To survive, the commons will have to accept and swallow the harsh medicine of unlimited centralization for an effective and well-trained military corps. If the meeting occurs at all, we will propose that we pool our resources with the Orenburg to build an effective defense force. Endless blue inspiration. Oh, crap. I knew this would happen again. I knew. I should have kept these guys down here. And that's why we, That's why I'm beelining towards all this extra stuff. <clears throat> oh, please don't lose. Please don't lose. Come on. You're fighting over ever. Come on, man. Come on. You're doing not too badly. Oh, this is so bad. And this blue inspiration. This guy's all rushed at left. And I totally thought. The grain blank is you are above. Could not be reached by the hunt accord, nor the parasites of conquest spawn. And neither by the squabbling tyrannies of the motherland. By definition, it was the greatest asset that the Rodina could offer. In some ways, it was the only semblance of unity the shards of her people could grasp. It was comforting that he had been ordered to observe the endless sky for half an hour, along with the hundreds of other recruits on the square of the barracks. Big thoughts for a village boy from Uts Katov, of course, but he had not... But had he not been encouraged to dream? A sergeant barked and the marshal began his walk to the podium in front of them. It suddenly came to attention only partly due to fear of the rod. The marshal brooked no discussion about his past, but the whispers floating around him hinted at a military one. Perhaps he had been remembered of the local garrison or even one of the veterans of the long march from Forkuta, even perhaps a brother to Mendrix himself. He was a commanding officer and figure, despite his age, dressed in faded khaki, with the flourishes of the Euro Guard. His deep lined face summoned as much fear as it did respect. Now he stood facing the cadet, speaking to speak from the microphone jury rigged to functionality. My fellow soldiers, it is with pleasure that I welcome you to the guard. I'll begin by asking one simple question. Why are we here? To save your parents, or perhaps to make your village proud, or maybe you think a place in our ranks will help you get laid. Laughter broke out across the parade square for half a minute. No, my friends, you are not here for your friends, family, god, or girlfriend. You are here to help me build my dream. I dream of a Russia where everyone is equal in service, and loyalty to his has loyalty to his fellow man. Where the hidden evils of the land are purged by common zeal. The marshal throws up his hands with a palm. Now you are here, and it will be your dream as well. A dream worth fighting for. Maybe a girl worth fighting for, but at least a dream. And there's nothing we can do about this. But it looks like we are doing so much better than before. Oh my goodness, can we win? Oh, we defeated them. Oh my gosh, we actually won. Oh, look, all that stuff we did earlier. All that stuff. Oh, that's not good, but... Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Ivan. Ivan. Yes, we won. Ivan. We came prepared. Because these guys are slowly... At least these guys will be slowly weakening themselves if they were doing um, raids and stuff, generally. But still. Now that we have so much PP, pee, pee Let's do that one. Conversations with the council. It seems that the Orenburg Times have finally allowed us to send an official envoy to their fiercely democratic council to enlighten the anarchists about the grave dangers that they will likely have to face in the near future. <clears throat> Some of our best officers have created certain props from which our envoys shall convey our analysis of the risk and solutions we have identified regarding the situation. The necessity to protect from raids conducted by the relatively well-disciplined SS bandits is a measure that will have to be considered and implemented to deal with a more clearly identifiable threat in the short term. A darker, more mysterious danger is also looming on the horizon for the communes. The Czechist army of Magnokitorsk. Magnitogorsk seems to have also shifted its keen eyes and ominous attention to the peaceful region. The threat posed by the Black Mountain is not easily quantified, but it's necessary to prepare preemptive defenses nonetheless. However, our delegates will reach through to their stubborn council, and an effective plan can be formulated with our help. Nice. And keep going. I want I want more research for now. We'll see how far we can get with this stuff, but still. We'll see what happens. Oh my goodness, it's not very far at all, is it? Hey, 670, not bad, not bad. Not too shabby. As much as I want to do this, I don't want to waste army XP, so... Um, honestly, with these many guns... You guys are only 12 combat width. We can make them at least 14. At the very least, 14 combat width. We lost some more guns, but it's fine. We don't have enough for anti-tank, but whatever. Whatever. <clears throat> Alright. Now we should have an event here, maybe? No, yes. Yeah, we'll see. Our common interests. Ooh. We can use more... Lowering training speed. Ooh! Ooh, lowering training speed, because that should affect this, right? Yeah. No, new guards initiated. So that should be good. You know, maybe we'll beeline towards that way. We With cat like Tread. With miles of lamb and patrol in few men to do it, the Euro League priority is mobility. Every part of the guard's training is to use all kinds of transportation, from the smallest motorcycle, horses, and trucks to the largest armored vehicles. Our guard will learn how to use every means of transport available. <clears throat> How to give them proper care and the role they can play on the battlefield. Not every situation calls for automobiles, so our guards will train extensively in movement by foot. Drawing on the experience of the long march from the Vorkutalog through the war-torn Russian hinterland. At the end of the training program, the recruits will have to conduct a fully equipped 550-mile march through the Russian woods, nicknamed the March of Death. It owes its name to the reality that a soldier will probably be killed or by bandits, animals, or weather that he lags behind and can't keep up with his platoon. Orenburg agrees to our meeting. Our proposal to meet with the Orenburg Council has been accepted by the Council. We still aren't sure whether we will manage to convince the Council bureaucrats or not, but it's a start and will at least give us a better chance to learn more about them. While we won't bother them, should these talks prove unproductive, we do need their aid in the form of the supplies that the city has amassed over the years. In return, our men will do what they can do uh, better than anyone else and provide protection for the city of Orenburg and the surrounding communes. 
They may be distrustful of us for now, but our aid should go a long way in forging a bond between our lands. Additionally, we intend to aid them in training their own militia so that even after the most pressing threats of Dovong and the NKVD of Black Mountain have been dealt with, they can still defend themselves without our direct aid. The Southern Euros are a dangerous place, and with refugees fleeing to us in the communes of Orenburg daily, the roads to travel are on, on, like, hunting grounds for bandits and raiders, keen to take advantage of those in need of shelter. They are alone. Orenburg is alone. We must protect both. Only by standing together with the communes and protecting the South Euros, we can hope to secure a brighter future for the people here. We can only hope that the Council sees it that way, too. Let the soldier meet the councilman. And we'll continue with Cat Like Tread. Every possible resource? Uh, we'll see, maybe. Uh, despite the uncontested superiority of her man on the battlefield, the League does not possess enough resources and equipment to face both Dorlungus, Bandit Horde, and Lysenko's check ins. Abandoning the people of the Ural Mountains is not an option, so we'll use our ingenuity to produce the ma material necessary to end our foes. Local Uralian gunsmiths already produce a variety of small arms, and though they are of inferior quality, beggars can't be choosers. Commandant Staranov is an enthusiast of impro improvised explosives of all kinds, from the smaller bombs used by our saboteurs to blow up enemy ammo depots, to mines made from fuel barrels that can wipe out an entire army platoon when someone, some poor dude steps on one. Other creative proposals are handmade suppressors for our commander units and crude artillery pieces using metal pipes and gas cylinders. Conversations with the Council. <clears throat> Politics like Russian ballet. It did ideally consists of purposeful emotion, executed with grace. Image, imagine a vast stage in a hall where the Orenberg and League delegations have gathered here. Delegates pirouette, while Ron Delamos taking care to maneuver just clear of the fundamental disagreements. At the same time, circling the chosen targets and moves just erratic enough to be deniable. This is a state of play between Orenberg and the League, and is beautiful in its own dangerous way. The actors play the roles with the expected level of conviction. The Euro League begins with reassuring comments on common purpose, and a greater one even. A common desire for the improvement of the Russian people, a love for this broken land, and a shared desire to make it whole. One or two delegates tear up, moved by the display, others call nod clinically, noting that the representative has managed to say in so many words nothing concrete at all. The Orenburg Council is no less adept reiterating the previous comments. They offer similar words of acceptance and mutual trust, and propose a building of mutual relations that will surely definitively provide a progress to mutual unity. No clarification is forthcoming or needed about what this unity will look like. Everyone knows what the future holds in their own heads. The dance continues, icy and perfectly arranged. Slowly, the atmosphere begins to thaw, and counselors and representatives prepare their pre-written notes. The hardliners brace themselves with a barrage, and the papers are passed between the council and the league delegation. And so the dancers pick up space, and the Urals, caught in display, turn on hinge. On to the real proceedings. But if you enjoy this video and episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I guess I'll see you tomorrow to see if we can continue holding out against Dovanga's Brigade and the crazy Lysenko. Thanks for watching. Have a great, 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 great rest of your day.